Hey guys, as you guys know, Pastor Scott has been in Israel for two weeks, and it's just been, we're so excited about it. Today we're actually going to be able to hear him teach from Israel once again, and uh, just how how cool is this, man? It's it's just awesome to be able to hear him teach and then see in the background the place that God says that he has a zeal for, which is Israel, and he, it says he's zealous for Jerusalem in particular in the book of Zechariah. God has a passion for that place, and it's just wonderful to see our pastor there for the first time, his excitement of being there. Um, I know I'm certainly excited about it, but before we listen to Pastor Scott, Pam's going to come up and share kind of this week's of pictures of, of Israel. So here she comes. Well, I have great news for you guys. Pastor Scott is back in Tucson. So I, I picked him up last night, he and Sean, and um, boy, I'll tell you, these guys are flying high. They have had such a great time. So he has sent a bunch of pictures um, from last week. I'm going to share them with you today. And um, last Sunday, they were at the Wailing Wall, and... Um, let me get to my, okay, hold on one second. Technical difficulties. But I thought I lost the computer earlier, so this is good news. I still have the notes. There we go. Okay, so um, this was a very emotional day at the Wailing Wall. Um, the Wailing Wall is the name the Muslims gave it because they control the Temple Mount. The Western Wall is what the Jews call it. The Orthodox Jewish people believe that God's presence never leaves this place. They say that this is the place where heaven and earth meet. And they saw people just crying out to God, and Scott said that this was really um, an incredible place. So another um, really emotional place that they went to this is still the Wailing Wall. They went to the Holocaust Museum, and um, the profound scripture on the ark as you leave is um, Ezekiel 37, 14. I will put my breath into you, and you shall live again, and I will set you upon your own soil. So um, they weren't able to take any pictures inside of the Holocaust Museum, but um, it was, how many of you have actually been there? Do I see a hand? A couple people back there, yes. So that was really incredible place. And then this is a scale model of ancient Jerusalem, looking at the temple through the Golden Gate. Um, a gentleman in his 50s used the Bible as he designed it. It has been confirmed by archaeologists to be um, identical to the way it really looked. Um, Archaeology is always catching up with the scriptures, as we know, and this is another uh, reliability of the scriptures. And this is Sean and Scott in front of the, um, the amazing scale model of the ancient city. So cute. All right, so Sean is conquering the National, the National Museum of Israel here. And these girls um, do not speak English, um, but they understood perfectly what he was doing here. Um, we say he spoke the international language through foil art. <laughs> and this is an inscription dedicating the square in Caesarea to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. This is a significant confirmation of biblical narrative. Prior to this discovery, they believed that Pontius Pilate did not even exist, but once again, Archaeology is catching up with the Bible. Yeah. Okay, another um, finding in the Israeli Museum is a bone box belonging to Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest who orchestrated the death of Jesus. Okay, so this is a flock of sheep, and you see a shepherd in the background there, and it actually was a woman. So um, I just love the scripture found in John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and the analogy of our Heavenly Father as our Good Shepherd. 
And here is Sean overlooking Bethlehem. This is the birthplace of King David and Jesus. And this is the site where Israel entered the Promised Land under Joshua and where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. All right, so Scott and Sean are at the Jordan River with Israeli defense soldiers. And check out those machine guns. They said they really felt safe. There was a lot of security around. So, all right, so this is the ritual bath at Qumran. The Jewish sect um, built this community. Believed, they believed in being baptized twice a day, every day, and they were a mighty clean bunch. <laughs> All right, so this is the ritual steps going down into the bath. And can you imagine walking those steps being all wet? They were very, very steep. And when they came into the bath, they would go into a fetal position and be fully emerged and then come out of the water as a symbolism of leaving the old life and entering a new life. This is on the road to Jericho, um, where the Good Samaritan rescued the man. It's a very desolate area and an easy spot for ambush. And this is the ancient road, um, Roman road, traveling from Masada to Jerusalem. <laughs> and this is at the hilltop fortress of Masada. 950 Jewish men, women, and children held out against 7,200 men, a man, Roman legion. And um, last um, service, I asked if someone could Photoshop those people out of that picture, and we got about five people. So we're going to definitely get a great picture of the two guys standing um, at the top of that fortress. And um, isn't that a great picture? All right, so this is... Um, this is a view of the Roman legion camp and the siege wall from Masada, keeping the en enemies out. You, where you see that crevice going down, that's the siege wall. And Sean is um, with a model of Masada complex that was built by Herod the Great. He wanted to have a place where he could flee and because he had a lot of enemies and um, Herod died before his fortress was completed. Sounds like Scott's calling. <laughs> and the artwork from the elite priest home that was burned in the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The tour guide believed that this was Caiaphas's home because it was so luxurious. And this is Scott and Sean in the Jewish section of the old city of Jerusalem. And you can see the Mount of Olives in the background. Okay, and this is the Damascus Gate of the old city of Jerusalem. And <clears throat> this is where you're going to see Scott filming his, com his commercial, his sermon today. Um, <laughs> he's in front of the um, Damascus city, and that's the city gate. And this is the place of the skull known as <clears throat> Gordon's Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. And um, this is an example <coughs> of the 1,200-pound stone that sealed the entrance to the garden tomb. And this is the actual place where Jesus wrote, um, pla his body was placed inside the garden tomb. <laughs> and this is the actual place where Jesus rose from the dead. Um, this is a wine press dating to the time of Jesus near the garden tomb. And um, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. <coughs> this is the site where Jesus <coughs> prayed, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he prayed for strength the night of his betrayal and arrest. Jesus prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. And you see here the view of the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. This is a place where Jesus predicted the destruction of Herod's 18-story temple 
and his second coming. And um, this is a picture of the Temple Mount. Scott said it was a very um, depressing place. Um, the Muslims control it, and they would eavesdrop on the tour guides, and if they said the word Temple Mount, they would yell at them and say, not Temple Mount, Aqsa Mount. And so there is a lot of hostility here. Um, the Muslim built this cemetery outside the royal gate into Jerusalem in an attempt to render the ground ceremonial unclean to the Jews and hence block the path of the Messiah that is prophesied to re-enter here. And um, Scott said, somehow I think that Jesus will find a way around this one. <laughs> These are the elaborate pools of Bethesda. Beth I had a problem with that one. Beth yeah. Bethesda, described in John 5. This is a place where Jesus healed a man who had been sick for 30 years. The skeptics, the skeptics said it didn't exist until it was discovered in the 60s. And what is a slide presentation without showing food? <laughs> so the food was incredible. They had, and who would know that the best burgers in the world were found in <laughs> Jerusalem? Sean left his shawarma. And um, this is the group of the 85 people that went from Calvary Chapel, Tucson, and um, they just had the most incredible time. Some of them have traveled on to Italy, and they've done other tours, but uh, the majority of them came back yesterday, and um, just, it's going to be so exciting to hear Pastor Scott and just the excitement that he has with the scriptures. He said that um, it went from black and white to living color, and um, he is just on fire. So um, the scriptures are not subtle about that we are to love Israel. And in Genesis 12, 2 through 3, it says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And um, I'm excited to say that um, we have started a sign up and we already have 40 people since the last service. We're gonna, we could be taking two buses at this point with the, this kind of response. One bus is 50 people, so that's five more couples. So um, we are looking at going April 8th of 2000. 18. So signups are in the foyer. We're going to be going to Israel and um, it's going to be a fabulous time. So now we're going to hear Scott's message from the, um, Israel at the Damascus Gate. Shalom from Jerusalem. Sean and I are on site just outside of a place called the Damascus Gate. Now one of the things that makes the Damascus Gate very significant is that we are less than 200 yards away from another site known as Gordon's Calvary and the Garden Tomb. These are very significant sites because according to a number of scholars, this is where Jesus was crucified outside the city walls that you see behind me. And also the place where he was laid in a tomb and raised from the dead. Boy, when we think about the garden tomb, we think about a place of emotion. We think about a place of devotion. Boy, Sean and I went through there and looked at the site. There were all kinds of people overwhelmed in prayer, thinking about the, the universe-changing events that took place in the garden tomb. But it's also a place of commotion as well. Uh, there's a debate as to whether this site or another site known as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was the actual place where Jesus was buried and rose again from the grave three days later. But for our purposes this morning, I'd like to also point out to you that rather than just a place of emotion or devotion or commotion, uh, this place was also a place of revelation, uh, a profound revelation, a revelation that is detailed for us in the book of Romans, chapter 6, 
and verse 4. There the Apostle Paul wrote that just as Jesus was buried and raised from the dead, even so we are raised to newness of life. Boy, let that phrase sink in for just a second. A brand new life is made possible because of what Jesus did not very far from where we stand right now, some 2,000 years ago. Boy, if there was ever a poster child of a life transformed by the message of the resurrection, we meet her in John chapter 20 and verse 1. There we read this amazing eyewitness account of Jesus' resurrection. It begins with these words. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Well, this personality we are introduced to here in the, uh, this incredibly intimate and powerful account of the resurrection was Mary Magdalene. Now, a, a less likely individual to be the first person who realized that Jesus was risen from the dead, you probably could not find. As a matter of fact, in the book of Mark, chapter 16, and verse 9, we are told this detail about Mary Magdalene's life. She was a woman from whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. Now, if you've been following along with us uh, on our trip, one of the uh, wonderful sights that we were able to see was a place up in the Galilee region known as Magdala. Mary Magdalene's name derives from that. She was a woman who was a part of the city of Magdala. But uh, we saw the, uh, the ruins there at Magdala. It was an incredibly moving place by the way, because at Magdala, there is an excavation of a synagogue that dates to the first century. Uh, Jesus had a traveling preaching ministry in all of the synagogues in the cities around northern Galilee, the Galilee Triangle, as it's known uh, by uh, scholars. And one of those places was Magdala. It was an incredibly overwhelming experience to see this ruin and to particularly look at a place in the front of the synagogue, which was known as the place of the scriptures, a place where visiting rabbis and scholars would talk about the word of God, a bench that was part of this first part of this synagogue still exists there today. And to realize that Jesus himself sat on that bench and proclaimed God's word, well, both Sean and I were amazingly overwhelmed by that. So here we see this incredibly spiritual side, in a sense, uh, a place where there was a synagogue, and yet how did Mary end up getting so messed up? Well, there's a lot of speculation, but another place that we saw in northern Galilee, at a place called Caesarea Philippi, was also a place that was devoted to the worship of pagan idols. Particularly, there was a uh, temple that King Herod built in honor of the pagan god Pan. Uh, we tend to think of Pan, and, and he's sort of been a little bit romanticized and softened over time, but Pan was an incredibly scary individual. He was known as the god of chaos and also the god of the forest and of the hunt. If you got lost in the wilderness, uh, you probably had Pan to blame. In fact, our term pan ik comes from that deity Pan, because when you look at Pan, he looks like every modern picture of Satan you've ever seen. Well, remember something, these pagan deities were not just uh, things that people worship on a whim, not just part of a coexist bumper sticker. These pagan deities meant business. They were representations of demons. It may very well be possible that Mary had drifted into that kind of worship and as a result got more than she bargained for in the process. But what a wonderful thing it is that Jesus delivered her from seven demons. Uh, the number seven in scripture, the picture of completeness or fullness. She could not have been more demonically possessed. And yet Jesus set her free and she never forgot it. She was one of the few people that hung in there with Jesus, even during the time of his crucifixion. So on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Now, now notice the first day of the week is mentioned here. Some people will say, well, why do you at Calvary Christian Fellowship worship on Sundays instead of the Jewish Sabbath? Well, the early church adopted the first day of the week, which is Sunday, as their day of worship. Why? Because it commemorated the events we're about to see described here, the very resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, notice when Mary got there, it was still dark. 
Uh, scholars believe that this was a reference to the time of 3 to 6 a.m., the fourth watch of the night. Boy, those are those times sometimes when we are overwhelmed with panic in our own lives. Uh, anxieties tend to flood in those sleepless nights, those wee small hours of the morning as they are known. But, but they can also be times of great revelation, as we're going to see in just a moment. In fact, in the book of uh, Psalms 63 and verses 6 and 7, uh, we are told uh, by King David uh, that, that uh, he sought God in the night watches uh, and discovered God's incredible blessings and peace uh, resting upon his life. So the next time you have a hard time sleeping, say between 3 and 6 in the morning, you really want to drive the wicked one crazy if you feel like you're spiritually attacked or or you're overwhelmed with anxiety, turn it around into an opportunity to pray. Uh, seek the Lord during those times. Uh, again, because he's at your right hand, uh, you will not be moved. Your heart can also speak to you in those night seasons. So Mary Magdalene comes in a very dark time. Uh, Jesus has been crucified. They have no real hope of a resurrection. Nothing in, in the slightest was on their minds. She just wanted to give the Lord a decent burial as a sort of a closure gesture, a way of saying goodbye to this person who had done so much for her. But while she was still, it was still dark, she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. The term taken away there in the original language, the Greek word iro, it's a, it's a form of that word, literally means to take something and toss it away as if it were nothing. Well, these uh, stones that were rolled in front of tombs oftentimes weighed anywhere from 800 pounds to over two tons. Well, this stone had been uh, trivial, <laughs> trivially and easily tossed away. How did that happen? Well, the book of Matthew gives us a little bit more detail. We are told now after the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone for the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Well, this was the aftermath of all this. Some people look at this account in John and say, well, if that happened, why was Mary still so bummed out? Well, it's entirely possible that Mary might have fainted at the first sight of that angel appearing in its overwhelming glory. There, there's evidence in the text that might suggest that that's exactly what happened. She didn't see all of these things. She was just as overwhelmed and, and seized with fear as the Roman guard that was placed in front of the tomb. So she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb, came to herself, came back to the tomb, and saw that something radical had happened. She didn't know exactly what had happened. And so what did she do? Well, verse 2 tells us, then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved was the Apostle John. He never likes to refer to himself in first person, but uh, he uses this kind of long hand to describe himself. So she runs to Peter and to the disciple whom Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. She is evidently still not convinced that something wonderful has happened here. She thinks an incredible tragedy has taken place on this site, that, that someone has stolen Jesus' body. And, and the thing that I love about Mary Magdalene here was that she didn't keep her spiritual insights to herself. When she was confused, when she was overwhelmed, she went and sought godly counsel. Boy, that's so important for us. That's why the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. But uh, all the more as you see the day approaching, we need to be together so that we can stimulate one another to love and good works, the writer of Hebrews says. So she sought out that kind of godly counsel. Uh, Peter and, and John had no idea what was going on. So verse 4 tells us they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet did not go in. Now, uh, on the one side of the coin, we see the humility of John here, and not referring to himself in first person. But we also see that, that, that John kind of had a little bit of, of our sort of pride involved there, because he does point out, hey, I, I beat Peter in a foot race. I was the first one to look in. The, the humble side kind of kicks in, though, 
Because when he gets there, he's stooping down. And by the way, when you walk into the garden tomb in Israel, you have to stoop down. The, the entrances are very, very low. But he stooped down, looking and saw the linen cloths lying there, yet did not go in. In other words, he just took a glance at what was going on. He was so frightened by what was happening. He was so overwhelmed. He just took a, a peek around the corner, but didn't really dare to go in. The word there in Greek, blepo, means to see something superficially, just to be able to, to get a visual picture of what might have been happening in that particular circumstance. It can mean a glance, a look at ex externals, but, but not really an understanding of anything behind those externals. So uh, we we're told then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. Just like Peter, he's going to boldly go in there and try to figure out exactly what was going on. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now, in verse 6, we are told that Peter came in, and notice it says that Paul went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying. The word see there in the original language is another very interesting and very carefully chosen word. It's the word theoro. Uh, it, it, it carries the idea uh, of contemplating. So we get our term theorize uh, from this particular word. So he's looking, but Peter is trying to figure out, he's trying to make sense of exactly what has gone on in this set of circumstances. So notice he sees, uh, tries to theorize why the linen cloths were lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. The language here indicates that what Peter saw were, were the grave clothes that Jesus was laid in, completely in state, uh, completely uh, empty, but almost like a, a empty cocoon. Uh, there was no sign of grave robbing here. There was no sign of the, the clothes being torn off. It looked as if Jesus had just evaporated his way out of these particular claws. And, and in verse 8, we are told, then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. This is referring to John and he saw and believed. Now, that's an interesting thing to say. He saw and believed. Believed what? Well, as we're going to see in this passage, he didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. Uh, as we're going to see later on, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. They're not putting two and two together here. All they are doing at this particular point is realizing something mysterious, something maybe even miraculous, but, but how to define it was still beyond their comprehension. So once again, we see these things lying completely in state. They saw and believed. The, the word see there is another word for see in the original language. It's the Greek word eido. It carries the idea of seeing something and understanding the significance. That, that, again, something amazing has happened here. Well, this always brings up an issue, this idea of Jesus' grave cloths lying in state. Uh, there are those that will always ask at this point, so how did this miraculous thing take place? Well, we may get a bit of insight into this from something you've heard before, the Shroud of Turin. Uh, if you've never seen it before, you know that this, uh, this uh, shroud that was kept in a church in Turin, Italy, for years and years, centuries and centuries, is a fascinating one. Because for years people looked at it and they thought it was some kind of shrine to Christ, at least that's how it was built. But uh, they, they couldn't really recognize what was going on until in the late uh, 1800s, a fellow took a picture of it. And he looked at the picture and saw the photographic negative and suddenly jumping off the photographic negative was a picture of a man, roughly about five foot 11 inches in, in height, 175 pounds, a muscular build. He had long hair that was tied into a, a ponytail. And uh, the speculation was, well, this is the, the burial cloth of Christ. Well, uh, is the Shroud of Turin authentic? We can't know for sure, but there are certainly some curious things about it. First of all, if it's a fake, there's no sign or trace of paint on the Shroud of Turin. Nobody has been able to figure out how you can make an image that shows up perfectly as a photographic negative, but not uh, at, at, at first glance, at first sight. The Shroud of Turin project in 1978 came to the conclusion that the, uh, the uh, Shroud of Turin was not a fake, it was not a phony, that it did contain uh, human blood and a, and a scorching that was difficult to be able to explain. It's still beyond the, the realm 
of science to explain. So here we see this amazing evidence that backs up what the gospel says, that, that Jesus uh, basically uh, radiated himself out of this. His resurrection body, the same body that would allow him to be able to enter into rooms uh, without even knocking, was fully operational at that particular point. Now, I know some people say, well, you know, the Shroud of Turin, that's what really proves uh, the, the, the message of the Bible. No, it, it doesn't prove the message of the Bible. The Bible lends authenticity to the Shroud of Turin. Here we have a far more accurate testimony in the Word of God. And you might recall that uh, sometimes proof seekers, uh, you know, God will meet them to a certain extent, but he always wants them to go beyond the seeing is believing mentality. In fact, in the, uh, later on in this very same chapter of John, you might remember the story of doubting Thomas. How Thomas, uh, who uh, was not present when the Lord revealed himself to the other disciples, uh, essentially said at that particular point, uh, you know, I won't believe unless I can take my finger and put it into the nail prints in his hands and put my hand in his side. So, uh, you know, again, Jesus appears. He says to Thomas, Thomas, uh, reach here your finger and put it into the nail prints in my hands. Uh, stretch out your hand and put it in my side. Be not unbelieving, but believing. Well, Thomas fell on his knees and looked at Jesus and said, My Lord and my God. Well, Jesus said to him, uh, Because you've seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who haven't seen, yet have believed. Well, why are we so blessed? Well, understand something. Our faith in Christ can't just be based on on the idea of facts and evidences. That could be a great platform, but it's only enough when we put our trust, our faith, enter into a relationship with Jesus. And boy, you want to talk about a relationship with Jesus based on the resurrection. That was precisely what Mary Magdalene was about to enter into. Verse 11 of John chapter 20 says, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she, if she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she would said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Well, here we see this, this uh, really very human uh, description uh, of what was going on in that set of circumstances. First of all, we see these angels interacting with Mary. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Well, from a human point of view, we might say, well, no, duh, why she's weeping. She thinks that Jesus has been crucified. She now doesn't even have the body to give him a decent burial. No wonder she's weeping. But from heaven's point of view, not the same thing. You know, again, when Jesus appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he said, oh, foolish men, and so slow of heart to believe in all that the scriptures have said. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? So here in this passage, we see another very important uh, thing that we need to understand. Here, Mary Magdalene has a vision of angels. How many of you would give your right hand to have a vision of angels? Most of us would. But the, the long and the short of it is, is that uh, this was not going to be enough. Not until she got to Jesus. You know, a few years back, there was kind of a fad about, you know, do you have a guardian angel? And people would have bumper stickers saying, never drive faster than your angel can fly. You know, the Bible does say in Hebrews chapter 1 that angels are ministering spirits sent to aid those who will inherit salvation. Don't get me wrong. Angels are definitely, as Billy Graham put it, God's secret agents. And maybe you've had an encounter with an angel. You don't even really know it. But if you do have an encounter with an angel, understand an angel is not going to point to themselves. They always point to Jesus. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, the apostle John, overwhelmed by the series of visions that he was give, given, fell down to worship the angel who was his heavenly tour guide. The angel said, see that you don't do that. Worship God. I'm just a servant of, of the Lord like you are. For the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Even prophecy itself, properly understood, always brings you back to the person of Jesus Christ. Well, Mary has a vision of angels, but it wasn't going to stop there. Notice in, uh, in verse uh, 15, things get very, very interesting indeed for Mary Magdalene. Now, when he had said, she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you carry him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, 
Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbani, which is to say, teacher. Wow, notice this amazing moment of an eye-opening reconnection of relationship. Mary looks at Jesus and said, uh, Jesus looks at, at Mary and says, Mary. You know, I don't think it was just saying her name that opened her eyes. I think it was the way that he said it. There was a tenderness there. There was a connection there. You know, when we have relationships with people, uh, especially people that we love the most, isn't it funny how they have a very special way of saying our name? Maybe as a, as a little kid, you remember how your parents could say your name in a way that was very significant. Boy, if my dad ever said Ralph Scott Richards, I knew I was in big trouble. But on the other side of the coin, there's nothing more tender than hearing your, your parent say something like, Scott, I'm really proud of you. Well, that was a very similar moment. I think the intonation, the inflection, suddenly that became uh, caused Mary's eyes to open. And notice, uh, she uh, uh, again, uh, 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 turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I've not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. Now, this is the last part of this that tends to throw people a bit. Uh, Jesus said, do not cling to me. In the original language, uh, the nuance of the Greek carries the idea of stopping something that's already going on. In other words, Jesus... Uh, was standing in front of Mary. Mary fell at his feet and grabbed onto his legs with a death grip. It was her way of saying, I lost you once. I'm never, ever going to let you go. But notice what Jesus says. Let go, Mary, because there's something better going on here. I've not yet ascended to my father, uh, but go to my brethren and say, I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. Now, now, some people will say that he, Jesus didn't want Mary to touch her because he hadn't yet gone into the heavenly holy of holies and she could be defiled by the sin of the world. That, that, that I think, just doesn't hold up under examination. What Jesus is doing is giving the broad strokes about where his ministry goes from here. Uh, again, he is not going to set up the earthly Davidic kingdom, but rather he's going to provide for us uh, an amazing blessing. The book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who will be against us? If he didn't spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Catch this. It is Christ Jesus who died, furthermore is risen, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, who will also make intercession for us. What Jesus was saying is, I'm ascending to my Father Mary, and I'm going to be praying for you there and I'm gonna be watching over you there, and the ministry that you've experienced for me in the here and now is gonna be nothing compared to that ministry that not only saves us, but keeps us saved. So, very interesting encounter there on that first Easter Sunday, there at the Garden Tomb, not very far from where Sean and I are and coming to you uh, today. But the most important thing is this, the biggest revelation and I think we can take away from the resurrection uh, is not just the, the historically accurate and reliable message that Jesus is indeed risen from the dead. But we need to ask ourselves another question. Who did God choose to receive this revelation first? Probably the least likely person you could ever imagine. Uh, you know, again, uh, from tradition and culture, uh, Mary was a classic example of a three-strikes-you're-out candidate to be the first witness that Jesus rose from the dead. She was sexually disqualified, you understand. Uh, pious Jews of Jesus' day used to begin their prayers by saying, I thank thee, O Lord God, King of the universe, that I was not born a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. You know, as far as their mentality went, women were, well, second-class citizens. Even societally, uh, Mary Magdalene was disqualified. Did you know that women's testimony was not allowed in a court of law, and yet God selects her to be a witness of the resurrection. How about spiritually? Boy, if you've got a spiritual track record that includes having seven demons cast out of you, and you come and say, yeah, Jesus is risen from the dead, eh, chances are people might say, oh, looks like Mary's off her nut again. Uh, maybe she's been messing around with those, uh, with those panic attacks, if you will, again. Well, lo and behold, God chooses Mary out of all people. Why is that? 
Well, maybe, just maybe, it's for the same reason he chooses people like you and me. Uh, I love what the Apostle Paul said in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1 and verse 26. There he wrote, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of this world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Mary gloried in her Lord. Her glorious encounter with Jesus speaks volumes to us, even in this day. And you know, that's the secret of being a witness for Jesus Christ. It's not us having our act together. It's not us saying, well, you can be as wonderful as I am if you come to Jesus. No, our lives sometimes can serve as stark contrast to the light and love and perfection of Jesus. We can be exhibit A to this world. And if God could save people like you and me and Mary Magdalene, there's hope for each and every person. Have you made that decision? Have you given your life to Jesus? Maybe you think you've got to get your act together, or maybe you're not good enough to come close to Jesus Christ. You are precisely the kind of person Jesus desires to see come to him. All you need to do is to realize that you need a Savior, that your sin has separated you from God, and that not very far from here, at Gordon's Calvary, this stark picture of a skull etched into the the side of a mountain where Jesus hung and bled and died on a cruel Roman cross. He did it to pay the price for your sins. When he died, the last words he spoke were, it is finished. Your salvation was fully paid for. Now, the only thing you have to do is receive it as a gift. The Bible tells us, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. The Bible says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God wants to give you that forgiveness and that grace and that mercy. And maybe you belong to the Lord for a while and you've kind of given up on you. Maybe this is the time to pray and give your life back over to the Lord and realize that he does his greatest work with very funny material. Just pray this prayer right along with me. Father, I thank you for your mercies and your grace. Thank you for this picture of the kind of people that you call into your forever family. And Lord, I pray that if there are any within the sound of my voice that have never made that decision to receive you as their personal Savior, that you would speak to them right now. You say in your word, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Lord, you tell us in your word to as many as received you, to, you, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. I pray, Father, if there are any within the sound of my voice, that are listening to this and, and have not made that decision to pray and receive you, that right now they would simply pray this prayer, Lord, I know I need you in my life. I believe that Jesus died on a cruel Roman cross and suffered to pay the price for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead so that I could have life. Just like Mary Magdalene, I don't come to you because I deserve it or earned it. I come to you just on the basis of your mercy and grace alone. Please forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Make me a brand new person from the inside out. This day I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And Father, I pray as well, perhaps for those who are listening, who look at their lives and think, oh, God couldn't possibly use me, or God's given up on me. I pray that Mary's testimony and your beautiful, tender word to her, Mary, I pray you would speak their name in the spirit and the deepness of their heart and help them get back on their feet, back in the race, and allow your glory to shine in contrast to all of our weakness. Thank you, God, for saving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, shalom again from Israel. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.